Hey folks, Dennis here with Respiratory Sensei, and you may know me from Lindsay Jones. The PaO2 and the 8A gradient are the most powerful respiratory calculations we can do in our world. And in the next few minutes, I'm gonna show you how to calculate those things within 10 seconds and what to think about them. Hiya! All right, whether you're a respiratory therapist or perhaps you're an ICU nurse, knowing the PaO2 and understanding the A to A gradient, the PaO2 minus the arterial O2, is very helpful in understanding the condition of your patient. So we want to lay a foundation for us to do those calculations for sure, but let's first understand what we're calculating in the first place. If you'll remember, every time you take a deep breath in, the oxygen molecules that are out here in the air enter our lungs, they go through our airway passages, and they end up in those tiny little balloons at the distal end of our lung. We call those the alveoli, and there's 300 million of them. And then, of course, once the oxygen's there, it's going to cross something called the alveolar capillary membrane. This is a very magical membrane in your body. It is one of the only membranes that is just one cell thick. And so the oxygen will cross through that cell, that cellular wall, and enter the artery. And we can measure the oxygen pressure in both sides of those things. Now let's take a look at pressure for just a minute. If you'll remember something called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure. Do you remember that from school? That's okay. You don't need to know the ideal gas laws perfectly right now, but one of the things that the Dalton's Law says is that the more oxygen molecules that you cram into a specific tiny little space like the alveoli, the more pressure they're going to collectively exert. And we can measure that pressure in the artery. It's called an arterial blood gas. But we can also calculate what that pressure should be in the alveoli. And then we can compare those two pressures to see what's happening. All right, so let's take a look at that. All right, the first thing you need to know is that no matter how well that alveolar capillary membrane is made, when we get a certain amount of oxygen in the alveoli, not all of it can get into the artery, no matter how hard we try. Now, most of it does, and if you're normal and you have normal pulmonary pathology, most of the oxygen that you breathe into your alveoli does cross the alveolar capillary membrane and gets into the artery, but not all of it, no matter what you do, never can you get all of it in there. It's a bit, little bit like this can of soda here. You know, I can pop it open and I can drink it all. I can drink all of it, right? Well, not exactly, because no matter what I do, there's still going to be some left in the darn can. Yeah, there's still some in there. I know there is. Because of that, no matter what happens, you'll never see the total amount of oxygen that's in the alveoli enter the artery. Because of that, if I looked at the alveolar oxygen pressure, it's always going to be higher than that which is in the artery. And so we can always take the bigger number, the oxygen that's in the alveoli, and subtract the oxygen that's in the artery, and we're going to come up with a gap. Now, everybody is going to have a little bit of a gap. It might be three or four, as we'll see in the calculations in just a minute. It's a very, very small gap. But if that gap were to grow, then that's going to tell you something about the patient their ability to oxygenate from the alveoli to the blood. And that can be inhibited by lots of things, which we'll talk about. But that includes things like pneumonia, just secretions down there. It could also include disease processes like ARDS, where there's a thickening of that alveolar capillary membrane. So for us to understand the alveolar to arterial oxygen difference, we have to do a couple calculations. Let's take a peek at those. All right, the first thing we need to do is take a look at the actual formulas. For the blood gas, PaO2, or the amount of oxygen in the artery, all we have to do is a blood gas and just look at the value, and you've seen that before. But for the alveolar oxygen tension, or the pressure of the oxygen in the alveoli, then we need to do a formula. And so that formula can look something like this. And you've probably seen that before. It's a fairly intimidating formula. As you'll notice there, it has barometric pressure. It also has a water vapor pressure. Then you times that by the FiO2, which is a decimal form. And then on top of that, you have to subtract the pressure that's being exerted by the CO2. And you do that by taking the CO2 and divide it by the rest rate quotient, which is usually 0.8. Well, we don't want to do any of that. And so we're going to take that formula and we're going to get rid of that formula. And we're going to bring up this shortcut here. Now, this this is a lot more simple. We can calculate the P big AO2 by just taking the FiO2 or the oxygen percentage 
timesing it by seven, and then subtracting the CO2 that we got from the blood gas after we've added 10 to it. We'll of course practice those things, but that's the basic formula. So let's now go to the whiteboard and practice this and look at some real patients. All right, we're in the math lab now, and let's do some practice calculations. Remember what we're calculating is what we call the alveolar to arterial oxygen difference, more commonly known as the 8A gradient. And to do that, we have the formula of the big A, PaO2 with the big A, minus the PaO2 with the little a. And the first thing to remember is that we don't have to do any calculation with the little a. In other words, the little gradient that we have to calculate uh, is found in this little part right here, not the gradient, but rather the value for the PaO2 is right there in the blood gas. And so we're going to get that from the blood gas. What we care about, what we have to calculate is the big A, or in other words, the oxygen that's in the alveoli. And so for that, we're going to use a formula. And we have that big formula. We have the formula involving barometric pressure and the respiratory quotient. We don't need to do that because, yes, it would provide some great numerical detail, but we don't care if the difference in the 8A gradient is 300 versus 302. And so we don't need some of the intricacies of that. We'd rather just use a shortcut and really just very quickly, within a few seconds, estimate our value. So while walking down the hall in the hospital, we can look at a blood gas and immediately know what the 8A gradient is for our patient. And from there, we can do all kinds of things to understand their treatment. All right, so let's take a peek at that. Now, the first thing we need to do is re-examine our shortcut to evaluate for the alveolar oxygen tension or the oxygen that's in the alveoli. Remember that what we said was that the, P the PaO2 is equal to the oxygen percent times seven, and then we have to subtract the CO2, which is gonna come from the blood gas after we've added 10 to it. So now all we have to do is just kind of substitute some of our numbers. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so let's do in the live calculation here. PO2 is equal to, well, we need the oxygen percentage. And you have to be careful here. It's listed here as oxygen, but this is the decimal form. That's called the FiO2, the fraction of inspired oxygen. We don't want the fractional expression. We want the percent expression. So if it's 0.5, that just means that's 50%. And that's what we're going to substitute right here. Okay, and so let's do that. All right, so we'll put a 50 here, and then we times that by 7, and then we're going to subtract the CO2. The CO2 is also in the blood gas, and so we're just going to substitute that right there. And so we have a CO2 of 40, and then we're going to add 10 to that. And now we have set up our formula. So we've set it up with all the substitutions, and now all we have to do is just a little bit of very basic math, and it's pretty simple. Okay, all right, so we're going to say that the PaO2 is equal to 50 times 7 is 350, so that's pretty easy. And then the carbon dioxide, the CO2 plus 10, would be 50. And so what we have is the difference there. The PaO2 is equal to 350 minus 50, which is just 300. And if you're curious, it's going to be expressed as millimeters of mercury, sometimes called TOR. And that's because those are units of pressure measurement. Remember, we're measuring a pressure of the oxygen. It has to do with Dalton's Law. It's about the pressure that the oxygen is feeling. All right, so there, there we have it. Now, I'd be tempted to stop right there and think we got it, but we didn't. Remember, we have to do one more step. We're getting the gradient. And so what we have to do, just remember, the gradient is, so the A to A gradient is equal to the P big AO2 minus the P little a O2. If we forget that, that step, then we'll end up with the wrong number. And so what we're saying is the A to A is equal, well, the big PaO2 is 300. We just calculated that. And then we have to subtract the little AO2. But that's just simple. That's just what is here in the artery. And it just happens to be 80. And so we'll take minus 80. And so we get an 8A gradient of 220 millimeters of mercury. And that's our 8A gradient. Well, so what? What do we do with that? Well, that has meaning. And we'll talk about it toward the end of this video of what you do with that. But the 8A gradient of 220 can be treated in a certain way. Whereas other 8A gradients, less than that or even more than that, may need a different kind of treatment. So we'll bring that in right at the end. So just follow me for just a second. But before we do that, let's go ahead and look at another calculation to make sure we know what we're doing. Okay, so let's go back down here. Now, this is the same thing. We just have some different numbers. We're going to remind ourselves that the PaO2 formula is the oxygen percentage 
excuse me, the oxygen percentage times seven, and uh, times seven, and then we have to subtract the PaCO2 after we've added 10 to it. All right, so now we have our numbers uh, next to us. Let's go ahead and substitute those in, and we'll get those. So the PaO2 is equal to, well, how much oxygen are they on? Take a look at this, it's 0 0.3, that's the FiO2 version. If we want the percent version, we just have to times that by 10, and that would give us 30%. I don't have to put the percent here, I can, just to remind myself, but I just need the 30, really. Okay, and then times 7, and then minus the CO2. Now, the CO2 is going to come from the blood gas here. It's just right here. In this case, it happens to be 30, so we're going to just say 30 plus 10. And then now we have set up our formula with all of the numbers that we need. Now we can just simply finish that. Okay, so the PaO2, the PaO2 is equal to 30 times 7, which is 210, minus the CO2, which is 30 plus 10, which is minus 40. Okay, and there we have it. And then what we're going to get is a PaO2 of 170 millimeters of mercury. Okay, now we can't stop there. Remember, we have to subtract the little a in order to get the actual gradient. And so we're going to say the a to a gradient is equal to 170. Remember, that's the PaO2 minus what's in the blood gas. In this case, it's 60. So minus 60. And so now we have an a to a gradient of 110. And that's not that good in real life. We don't want that much. Uh, of a gradient for us. If you're a normal person, you don't have any pulmonary problems, your A to A gradient is probably five. You're probably losing five millimeters of mercury of pressure between the oxygen that's in the alveoli and the oxygen that's going to be end up in the artery. So it's very little. Some people only lose about three. Now, if I have a patient that's losing 110 or 50 or 60 or 300 or 400, then what I know is that there's problems with the alveoli. We'll talk about that in just a minute as well. But that's why we look at the A to gradient. Now let's talk about why the ADA gradient would get bigger and bigger. And so coming, coming back to our whiteboard here, let me just draw this out for you for a second. So what we have is we have an alveoli, and here we go, looks, this looks like this. And so oxygen is coming in. Oxygen's coming in here. So right through here, oxygen is coming. We have lots of oxygen, and it's surrounding the little alveolar capillary membrane because it's trying to go through the wall. Now on this other side of the wall, what we have here is we have an artery that is a blood that's trying to pick that up. All right, well, whatever the pressure is here, let's say we have uh, an alveolar, a PaO2 of 100, it's going to be less in the artery. If you're healthy, it's probably going to be about 97, but it's always going to be a little bit less. And so that's the way a normal alveoli would work if we're looking at that very carefully. Okay, but now let's take a look at another alveoli. Sometimes we might have an, an, an alveoli, alveoli that is not in good shape. And so we come here and it looks normal. Everything about the balloon looks normal. The only problem is the wall, the alveolar capillary membrane, has become has started to become very very thick and as you might imagine the little oxygen molecules are going to have difficulty getting through there and so that's going to be harder and because of that the a to a gradient the a to a gradient is going to become much larger there's another type of problem that can occur as well and that is that we have this alveoli here but it's starting to look kind of weird and so you can see that it's starting to collapse. That might be called atelectasis. And the problem here is that we do have oxygen that gets down into there, but there's not much space here. And then there's not much gas exchanging surface area for that alveolar capillary membrane. Plus it's kind of crunched up. The one cell membrane isn't as intact as it usually is. And so oxygen is definitely going to have trouble getting through that membrane. It just simply doesn't do it very well. And for that reason also, in that situation, our A to A gradient is going to be higher. In other words, it's going to be a bigger difference in the amount of oxygen that's in the, alve the alveoli compared to that which makes it to the artery. And so that's why we care about it. Now, let me talk to you about some values here. And we'll cover this more, of course, in another video in great detail. But let me just give you a, kind of a hint about where we're going with this. So we have somebody with an increasing A to A gradient. And here's what you can know about that. 
If any gradient value, and this is what we're looking at, so we want to look at the values here. If it's less than 65 millimeters of mercury, then we're going to call that patient mostly normal. That's a little bit of a simplification, but follow me on this for just a minute. But if the 8A gradient is greater than 65, but less than two, less, excuse me, less than 300, then we're going to call that a, what we call a VQ mismatch. I'll talk about that in just a minute. And then if the 8A gradient is greater than 300, we have a different sort of problem, and we're going to call that a shunt. Now that can also be called a venous admixture, which is a weird name, and if you're on the NBRC exam, for those of you RTs that are taking the exam, they may throw that out at you. But if you're not taking the exam, then the rest of us just call it a shunt. That's what that's about. Now why do we care about that? Because of this, it has to do with our treatment plan. So if we want to treat the patient, here's what this means. This means that if you have an 8A gradient that's normal, there's no treatment needed. They're getting sufficient oxygen from the alveoli into the artery, and so you're good. They're probably just breathing air. Maybe they have a little bit of oxygen going on in a nasal cannula or a mask, but they're fine. There's plenty of oxygen getting into the blood. If we get an 8A gradient between 65 and 300, we have a VQ mismatch, and the answer is you need to increase the oxygen percentage, also called the FiO2. And so if they're on 40%, you need to raise them up to 50%. If they're on 50, you've got to raise them up to about 60%. Now, if the 8A gradient is greater than 300, then there's a new answer. You need to use PEEP or positive inexpiratory pressure. And that might be in the form of CPAP. You've heard of that if they're breathing spontaneously. It also could be BiPAP, that's another way. But if they're on the ventilator, we're actually gonna call, call that PEEP. This is important because if you have a patient up on the floor, let's say they're not in ICU, and you don't like their blood gases, so you raise the FiO2, you put them on more oxygen, and you will go from 30% to 40% to 50% to 60%, if somewhere in there you start calculating their A to A gradient, you're going to find that they have crossed over from the 65 to 300 to over 300. And what that's going to tell you is that to be successful with that patient, you need to be using BiPAP, CPAP, or PEEP if you're going to put them on a ventilator. Otherwise, we see this all the time. Doctors will raise the oxygen to 70%, 80%, even 100%, and then they're not understanding why is this not helping the patient. And that's because the nature of their problem is a shunt, not a VQ mismatch. And remember, if you have a shunt, then the answer is to increase the positive airway pressure in the form of CPAP and BiPAP, or if they're on a ventilator in the form of PEEP. And that is the main reason why we calculate the 8A gradient. Remember, the main calculation we have to do there is to calculate the alveolar oxygen tension. But once we do, we subtract the oxygen that's in the artery, the little AO2, and we come up with that gradient, and then we label it. And then from the label, we decide how to treat the patient. If it's less than 65, we do nothing. The patient's probably fine. They're getting sufficient oxygen. If it's between 65 and 300, we raise their oxygen level that we're administering to them. But if it's greater than 300, then we need to involve positive airway pressure like CPAP or BiPAP, or if they're going to end up on a ventilator, we need to raise the PEEP. And so I hope that was helpful to you. And if you've liked this video, don't forget to subscribe. We have more videos coming up, especially those formulas that we've learned today. When we add one more formula to them called the shunt equation, those of you who are working in the intensive care unit will find this shocking and very, very helpful to understand what your ICU patients are going through once you calculate their total shunt. But to do that, we needed these first two calculations to do that. All right, I'm Dennis with Respiratory Sensei, and I'll see you next time.